Nature can be incredibly terrifying when it wants to. Every once in a while, it seems to kick us off our high horse to remind us who's boss. I'm your host, James, and these are the top 10 extreme climate events and what they mean. And we're starting things off with ocean acidification. So imagine the ocean as a giant sponge that's been soaking up a lot of the extra carbon dioxide we've been pumping into the air. As the ocean takes in more carbon dioxide, it undergoes a chemical change. That extra CO2 combines with water to create something called carbonic acid, basically a more acidic ocean. It's like turning the ocean into a slightly sour lemonade. So imagine trying to build a house with bricks that dissolve in acid. Well, that's the struggle for creatures like oysters and clams and some tiny sea creatures. The more acidic water makes it tough for them to grow their protective shells or skeletons. Coral reefs are like the bustling cities of the ocean, home to a gazillion marine species. But with ocean acidification, corals have trouble building their intricate skeletons, which is a big deal. We're talking real trouble for little fishies who call coral reefs home. Fish are pretty sensitive to changes in their homes. When the acidity goes up, it messes with their sense of smell, navigation, and even how they grow. And on an even smaller scale, if the little guys at the bottom, like the plankton, are struggling, it can cause a ripple effect, impacting everything up the food chain from fish to us humans. And at number nine, we have the year without summer, which was 1816, a real crummy year. That year, something bizarre happened around the world. It was dubbed the year without summer. What happened was a massive volcanic eruption that occurred a year earlier in Indonesia. Uh, this eruption was so colossal that it shot a huge amount of volcanic ash and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, when this volcanic debris spread globally, it created a sort of atmosphere atmospheric shield reflecting sunlight away from Earth. The consequence was a significant drop in temperatures across the northern hemisphere during the summer of 1816. People experienced cold temperatures, unexpected frosts, and in some places even snowfall during these summer months. I feel depressed just having said that out loud, just think of the impact it would have had on agriculture. Crops failed miserably, farmers watched as their corn and grains withered away in the fields, livestock faced hunger, and people who relied on farming struggled to put food on the table. But there was one awesome thing that came out of that magical summer of 16. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, uh, which is not surprising in the slightest. And at number eight, we have wildfires. Uh, so been far more of these things raging in recent years, often sparked by lightning or human activities like campfires or discarded cigarettes. But when conditions are particularly dry, lots of dead plants and trees trees around, it can quickly grow into a monstrous blaze. Nature can be a bit of a pyromaniac sometimes. Lightning strikes and like, bam, you've got a huge fire. But humans can play a big part too, whether it's a careless camper or someone not thinking twice before tossing a cigarette. But wildfires scorch everything in their path. Trees, plants, animals, you name it. The heat is so intense that it can turn towering trees into crispy matchsticks. Animals lose their homes, their hiding spots, and sometimes, sadly, their lives. But these extreme fires don't always just stay in the forest. As we know, smoke billows into the air, carrying particles that can mess with our lungs and turn the sky into a hazy, apocalyptic scene. When wildfires get too close to homes, people have to pack up and leave, not knowing when or if they'll have a home to come back to. And after the smoke clears, there's the aftermath, erosion, loss of biodiversity, and an increased risk of flash floods because there's no vegetation to absorb the rainwater and reduce runoff anymore. Next on the list, we have flash floods. The rain hits hard and fast, and before you know it, the streets turn into rivers. So here's the lowdown. Flash floods, as you can probably imagine, happen very fast, often within six hours of heavy rainfall or the sudden release of water. Unlike the slow and steady uh, types of floods, when heavy rainfall hits, especially over a short period or in areas with lots of concrete, like 
cities with limited green spaces where the rain can't seep into the ground as easily. It races over streets, sidewalks, and drains, causing chaos. Sometimes it's not just the rain though. If a dam breaks or there's a sudden release of water upstream, rivers and streams can overflow, catching everyone downstream off guard. Flash floods can sweep through neighborhoods, submerging homes, roads, and everything in their path. The water also moves fast. That swift current is powerful enough to carry away pretty much anything in its way. In, in hilly or mountainous areas, flash floods can trigger landslides. The water soaks into the soil, making it heavy and unstable, causing parts of the landscape to slide down like a muddy avalanche. Number six, droughts. These are prolonged dry spells that can turn lush landscapes into something more akin to a desert. There are a few reasons why droughts happen. Sometimes it's due to a lack of rain, but it can also be influenced by factors like higher temperatures, which lead to increased evaporation. Farmers depend on rain to grow our food, and droughts kind of make that difficult. Crops wither, fields turn to dusty landscapes. It's not just bad for farmers either. It leads to food, it leads to food shortages and price hikes for everybody. Droughts put a strain on water supplies, leading to restrictions, water shortages, and in extreme cases, the need for drastic conservation measures. And of course, nature, and of course nature has its own water needs. Droughts can dry up rivers and lakes, affecting aquatic life. Forests become more susceptible to those wildfires we discussed earlier. Droughts can contribute to desertification, turning once fertile lands into like a Mad Max style type wasteland. All right, this is a weird one. And number five, we have red rain. Yes, this is a very real thing, although it's incredibly rare. Uh, in July of 2001, people in Kerala were going about their usual business when suddenly raindrops weren't the usual clear or slightly cloudy, but a vibrant shade of red. No warning, no heads up just a sudden change in the rain's hue. This was uh, pretty horrific for everyone. Not every day that you see red rain falling from the heavens. Uh, cue the investigation. Turns out the color wasn't due to some divine apocalyptic event, but rather microscopic spores from local algae. The culprits were identified as airborne spores from a green microalgae. These tiny green algae got swept up into the atmosphere, and when they mixed with rain clouds, the result was a crimson rain. And at number four, we have tornadoes. I think anyone who watched The Wizard of Oz as a kid developed a bit of a fear of tornadoes. Unless you actually believed they would whisk you away into a magical fairy tale land, uh, that would be great. You know, talking lions, scarecrows, and witches, and aggressive flying monkeys, giant angry heads. You know what, maybe Oz freaked me out more than the threat of an actual tornado, now that I think about it. Anyway, these giant spinning columns of air reached down from a storm cloud to touch the ground. They usually show up when warm, moist air clashes with cool, dry air. This clash sets off a spinning motion in the atmosphere. If conditions are just right, that spinning can tighten into a tornado. When a tornado touches down, it's like a colossal vacuum cleaner sweeping across the land. It can tear up everything in its path. Trees, houses, even cars. The wind in a tornado is no joke. We're talking speeds that can make your average hurricane look like a gentle breeze. It's so powerful that it can lift heavy stuff into the air and toss it around like it's weightless. There's an area of the US called Tornado Alley and includes parts of Texas, Louisiana, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, the epicenter of tornado action. Number three, the Little Ice Age. What a cute name for something uh, that sucks, an ice age. Not something I ever want to live to experience, no matter how little you say it is. This was a significant period of cooler temperatures that stretched from roughly the 14th to the 19th centuries. Ugh, that's a long time. It was a long stretch where winter hung around a bit too long and summer seemed a little bit shy. The Thames River in London freezing over, creating frost fairs where people would set up markets and festivities on the ice. Cooler temperatures meant that growing seasons were of course shorter, which wasn't great for agriculture. Crops struggled to ripen, leading to food shortages and sometimes even famines. Mountain glaciers expanded during this period, so if you were planning a summer vacation to the Alps back then, you might have needed warmer clothes than you'd expect today. And it, and it wasn't always just a steady chill. It had its moments of extreme cold, and this period of cooling influenced art 
and literature. Paintings from the time often depict winter scenes, and there's a certain melancholic tone to some of the literature from this period. Scientists have said it was uh, likely a combination of factors that caused this mini ice age. Changes in solar activity, shifts in ocean currents, and a higher amount of volcanic eruptions spewing out sun blocking particles into the atmosphere like that awful summer of 1816 we discussed earlier. Next on the list is Haboob. Fun word. Uh, in 2011, Phoenix, Arizona experienced a weather phenomenon that sounds uh, kind of like a magical incantation rather than a meteorological event, the Haboob. This was a massive dust storm that swept through the city. Uh, Haboobs are walls of dust towering over everything in their path, moving like a tidal wave. In July of 2011, one of these colossal dust storms rolled through Phoenix, engulfing the city in this surreal, otherworldly haze. They typically form in arid regions when powerful downdrafts form a thunderstorm hit the ground, stirring up dust and sand. In Phoenix, the stage was set as a massive dust cloud gathered momentum in the desert. As the Haboob descended upon Phoenix, it transformed the clear blue sky into a murky orange brownish abyss. Visibility plummeted and the cityscape disappeared under this thick blanket of dust. Motorists were screwed. Anyone unlucky enough to be caught outside was screwed. Photographs and videos of this storm's arrival went viral. The contrast of that city skyline disappearing into this massive wall of dust is slightly apocalyptic looking. Finally, we have another one of the oddest events in the history of modern day weather, the Australian hailstorm of 1999. So it's a hot summer day in Sydney, Australia in April of 1999. People are going about their business, enjoying the sunshine, when suddenly dark clouds start to gather on the horizon. What started as a seemingly ordinary storm quickly escalated into a hailstorm of epic proportions. Hailstones the size of tennis balls, some even larger, began pelting down from the sky. As the mass of hailstones bombarded the city, chaos ensued. Car roofs were dented, windows shattered. It was basically a frozen artillery barrage, just wreaking havoc on the unsuspecting city below. The aftermath was no less dramatic. The scale of damage prompted a surge in insurance claims, making it one of the costliest natural disasters in Australian history. But there's always a glimmer of hope to be found, even in the darkest, or in this case, strangest of times. Uh, car repair shops were making bank, so good for them. With all that said, I've been your host, James, and I'll catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video.